a giant helicopter with a rotor diameter bigger than the length of a football field. It would be capable of not only transporting a good chunk of the Saturn V rocket to the launch site, but of actually catching it in midair as it fell with a parachute, ready to be reused for another launch. This is one of the biggest mind-boggling space concepts never built. Developing a reusable rocket technology using helicopters in the 1960s. Today on our new space channel, we'll be covering one of my favorite yet mostly unknown topics. The incredible helicopter designed to play catch with a moon rocket, the Hiller's Air Tug. In mid-1965, the USSR was making great strides to get a man to the moon, and good old capitalist America was having none of it. They jacked up NASA's budget to the stratosphere to try and get an edge in and win the space race. And this budget was huge, I'm talking billions of today's dollars, around 5% of the GDP of the whole country at the time. So your granddaddy's NASA had a ton of coin to play with, and with this came huge government contracts. Some of this budget went to building the Cape Canaveral launch site, as well as the Saturn V rockets that would eventually get manned to the moon only four years later. These rockets, as you likely know, were in stages that would split off one by one, with the boosters crashing into the sea to be potentially reused. The first stage of the Saturn V rocket would need to be recovered from the ocean only because it was a softer landing than the shore. Land was too damaging, no matter the parachutes involved, and it was decided that corrosive seawater would be a reluctant yet acceptable outcome. This is where Hiller's owner and chief engineer, Stan Hiller, insane helicopter proposal comes in. Their alternative idea was simple, and best described in his own words. They would recover the booster in its own element, as in the air while descending. Not a drop of corrosive seawater involved. But catching the Saturn V rocket, even the first booster stage, would be impossible with 1950s helicopter technology, and perhaps even helicopters today. That's where this new insane helicopter design comes in. It was monstrously huge, with a rotor diameter over 400 feet or 120 meters for our European friends. These rotors would have jet engines on the tips that would allow the rotors to make one rotation per second, which is very fast for something so damn wide. But I'll get to the physics problem in just a second. Its vast engine would be situated vertically in its rotor stem, and it would have two curving sides of its fuselage to help cuddle and stabilize the rocket in flight. Because it was so massive, it would have a huge empty weight of 450,000 pounds, and with the huge rotors at full power, be able to carry 550,000 pounds. A total, for those playing at home, of a gross weight of 1 million pounds. Impressive indeed. According to Hiller, it was technically not a helicopter, but rather a rotary wing system for booster recovery. But if it looks like a helicopter and goes whom 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 like a helicopter, then it is, with the added nickname, the Air Tug. This helicopter design, of course, made it perfect for other operations, well outside simple booster recovery, such as operating as a sky crane or an aerial transport for cargo both in the military and civil markets. Perhaps this helicopter would have gotten revenge for the Hiller's contract loss to the Hughes OH-6A K-use helicopter in the army a light scout helicopter used throughout the Vietnam War. 
So how exactly did this helicopter or flying tugboat actually catch a rocket in mid-air? Well, hold on to your harness because this helicopter ride is about to get really bumpy. Yeehaw! When the rocket was fired, the helicopter would take to the skies from a nearby airbase or Cape Canaveral itself. It would fly to the zone that the booster, the S-1C, would land and loiter in the area for up to six hours with its large fuel tanks, hovering at around 15,000 to 20,000 feet. When the booster separated and began its descent, it would deploy a sort of double tandem parachute. The upper section would have a hook. The air tug would approach the descending rocket and meet it at around 10,000 feet. At this point, the rocket would be descending along a glide path with more forward than downward velocity, making it perfect for an intercept by our hero helicopter. The air tug would fly the same glide path matching the speed and trajectory and would deploy a grappling hook and with help from a viewing platform on the side would snag the upper parachute or the pickup chute. The helicopter would then slowly slow its descent taking more and more of the booster's weight and centering the rocket directly underneath it assuming the same center of gravity. Once it was sufficiently slow enough and the helicopter was carrying the full load, the booster's parachutes would deflate and the fuselage would be suspended 700 feet below the helicopter. If the first pass was unsuccessful, there would be sufficient time for two more attempts before the rocket got too close to the water surface. But it's not over here. The helicopter would then reel in the booster using its powerful winch, which again was on board somewhere, and rotate the booster horizontal under the helicopter's U-shaped fuselage, fitting snugly and more aerodynamically sound. The air tug would then return to base for the booster to be prepped for another launch or other operations. Expensive as such a helicopter would have been at the time to develop, the huge aircraft would have paid for itself with the first several recoveries. So simple in theory, but there were some pretty major flaws. The thing is, the booster's trajectory from Earth took it on a flight that was well over 350 nautical miles away from land. In the words of the Space Review, how would the world's largest helicopter fly the world's largest rocket ever made all the way back home? Perhaps the solution to this problem is to have a large ship somewhere nearby for the helicopter to take off and land from, but this would have to be huge, aircraft carrier size, which negates really any savings made. Now let's talk about rotors. The blade spinning, even as slow as one rotation per second, was nearly supersonic. The concept called for one or two jet engines on the tips of each rotor to get it going, and this would mean that it would become the loudest aircraft ever made. And as you know, anything supersonic suffers huge wear and tear at those super fast, super hot speeds. Stan Hiller would go on to pitch this concept unsuccessfully to NASA, and in the end, NASA thought it would just be cheaper to risk having to replace the booster stage. And this was pretty much in line with thinking at the time. The eggheads at NASA were already starting to look into alternatives to rockets themselves, such as large space planes like the Lockheed Starraker, that making a giant helicopter for a giant rocket was starting to look like a foolhardy idea indeed. A footnote to this story is that Stan Hiller didn't actually give up on the idea of using helicopters to bring down the booster stage of rockets. But this time, five years later, he would actually put the rotors themselves inside the rocket stage. The rotors would be approximately 10% of the weight of the stage placed at the center of gravity and would remain folded till 
200,000 feet. It would deploy and land a booster accurately from 25,000 feet, allowing it to be reused. Naturally, this is still completely bonkers, but Merit is there for seeing what the future would bring 60 years later, with the SpaceX boosters landing themselves today. As for the Hiller's company itself, it actually ended up being wound up as a commercial helicopter firm and rolled into Fairchild, which eventually got wound itself up years later, with all that remains with some blueprints and a little scale model of a humble, yet insanely ambitious air tug. This video would have not been possible without the incredible research already done by the Space Review. So I suggest you head over there after this video and check out their many, many articles on the topic. And if you're new here, again, I ask you to subscribe and give a boost to the small but growing channel of space fans. And let me know in the description what I should cover next week. See you soon.